Let's find out more now. My guest Oded Aharonson, Professor of Planetary Science from the Wiseman Institute, joins me on the line from Israel now. Professor, thank you so much for coming on. This is the first time, obviously, since 1972 that Americans will be landing on the surface of the moon. Tell us a little bit more about the steps involved to make this mission a successful one. Well, this, we're talking about landing sites for the Artemis III uh, mission. Artemis III is going to be the first human mission to land on the moon, as you said, since uh, the Apollo mission. Before Artemis III, we will have Artemis I and Artemis II. Artemis II will be a human mission to the moon. It'll carry people to the moon, but we won't actually land on the moon on that one. We'll just fly by the moon. Artemis III will hopefully actually land on the moon, and this is why we need these landing sites uh, I only just touched on the possible landing sites before in my opener, but tell us more. Tell us about the different geological features these landing sites actually have. Right. Well, the most important thing to realize, I have my moon here, the most important thing to realize about these landing sites is they're all near the South Pole, as you indicated, which is down here on the moon. Now, the, moon is, the moon's orbit is aligned such that the sun is always very close to the equator of the moon, let's say over here. So if you land near the South Pole, what this means is any hole in the ground the sun barely rises over the horizon, which means that any crater or anything near the South Pole on the moon can be permanently shadowed. And this is the whole reason why NASA is so keen at, to land on the South Pole on the moon. These permanently shadowed craters are so cold that they harbor water ice. We have indirect measurements, and we recently even have more direct measurements that indicate that there must be some water ice near these uh, su southern regions on the moon. So, the, but you can't land in permanent darkness because the spacecraft won't have any power to power up or, or heat to power up its uh, its systems. So the trick is to find just the perfect spot to land such that you're in sunlight, but you can do a, a spacewalk, if you will. You, the person can traverse or a rover can traverse from the area where the rover, where the spacecraft landed into the shadow where the water ice is hiding. So I think that all of these landing sites were selected in close consultation with scientists who use models, and you can see the picture right now. Notice that each one of these boxes is in sunlight, has portions of it that are in sunlight, but it's close enough to shadow so that people can traverse and do this geologic spacewalk, if you will, and, and walk into the shadow and hopefully sample some of this ice. What about the criteria needed uh, in order to find these safe landing sites? What did you have to fulfill in that criteria? Right. So to safe landing sites could mean different things. Uh, the spacecraft need, I mean, obviously it has to be flat enough so that you don't hit a, a slope of a mountain when you land. You don't want to have too many rocks. Actually, these are all similar criteria to all landers. For example, you might remember the Bereshit uh, lander, which did not land successfully on the moon. But we also, uh, in my own group, had to select landing sites for Bereshit, and we used similar criteria for it. Why do you think it's still so important to go to the moon and send astronauts there, though, Professor? Uh, well, this is, you know, this is a huge question, and I think different people might have different answers, so I'm happy to share with you my answer. I think it's clear that uh, humanity, humanity's future is intimately entangled with uh, space. You know, eventually, I think people will go to space. We can argue about when that's going to happen, when are we going to start inhabiting other planets. But it's, we cannot argue about the fact that it's going to happen. It's, it's clear that it's going to happen. And I think the first step is going to be the moon. And I think the second step is going to be Mars. There are several things we know for sure. Now, you could say, oh, well, let's wait 10 or 20 years before we go to the moon and Mars again. But I think nowadays there's been enough of an international consensus that it's time to go back to the moon and, and that now is the time. And I think this is something that all of humanity can uh, unite behind. Thank you so much, Oded Aharonson, Professor of Planetary Science from the Wiseman Institute. They're joining me from Israel. Pleasure Thanks to be with time. you. Thank you.